So thank you everyone for sticking around. Uh, this is a test-driven approach to documenting RESTful APIs with a library called Spring Restox. I am Jen Strader. The best way to uh, follow me as well as to get the slides from this presentation is on Twitter. I'm code generator. Um, yeah, so welcome. I have three example apps uh, that I'm going to briefly touch on and that you can use for reference if you'd like to follow along with those. And I'll get started with a little bit about me. So by day, I am a senior consultant at Object Partners. We're a consulting firm out of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the United States. Primarily, we consult with, uh, or traditionally, with Groovy and uh, Java and have a variety of different services that, uh, and consultants. Always hiring as well if uh, you'd like to contact me. You may also know me as the co-founder of the organization Great Ladies. If you aren't familiar, Great Ladies is the organization uh, that supports women and uh, other diverse groups in the Groovy community. We have a number of outreach programs, educational workshops, and events uh, around the world now to uh, promote diversity within our community. The other big news you hopefully have heard by now is that I am moving here to Denmark in uh, roughly August. I have been awarded a Fulbright grant, which is a grant from the, the US State Department to uh, study here in Denmark, uh, including uh, looking at some really interesting things about Groovy. So that's a little bit about me. I'd also like to know a little bit about all of you that are out there. So this is a talk about creating RESTful APIs. So I assume that you have some working knowledge of how to create one. Uh, so kind of show of hands, who uses Spring Boot for APIs? Okay, a few, um, four or five grails. Okay, now all the hands are up. Um, and has anyone used Rat Pack? One, two, yay. Okay, um, so these are the three that I'm going to try to make comparisons between as we go. And so the next thing that comes up is uh, what tool you're using for documenting APIs using these tools. Uh, so who has used or is using Swagger? For, okay, um, looks like the same Spring Boot people. And who is using just ASCII Doctor as it is um, in kind of writing their own documentation as they go? To, okay. Um, I'm sorry? Raml? Okay, yeah, there are some other um, options as well that uh, unfortunately I don't have time to cover, um, but I'm going to try and make some comparisons to these two. Um, okay. So you know a little bit about me, now I know a little bit about you. Feel pretty confident that I can share a secret with you. I hate writing documentation. So when I was tasked uh, last fall with coming up with a centralized uh, documentation solution to integrate several of our APIs from different parts of the company, I wasn't really thrilled about that. Um, I knew it was going to be long and tedious, and I really wanted to find a better way to handle this. So there were several different things that kept coming up. The more we looked at different solutions, and even before we started looking at um, libraries, when we were just thinking about what all of these different APIs that we're trying to document had in common. And so the first core important thing that came up was what type of 
an API is it? Uh, so this is a um, graphic that I took from a blog post by Martin Fowler. Uh, and if you haven't read it, you should. The really interesting thing about this is the way that uh, APIs are categorized based on different features. So whether or not you're using uh, your, uh, the proper resource naming, whether or not you're following the HTTP standard when it comes to verbs, uh, and whether or not you're using hypermedia. And most of our APIs were kind of somewhere between level one and level two, but we always wanted to be open to the idea of using hypermedia in the future. So when we started looking at documentation tools, uh, there's a, a very popular image that comes up if you look at the other Spring Rest docs, talks that uh, Swagger, which is a, a very common competitor of, or you can use them together, I'll get to that. Uh, Swagger doesn't support hypermedia. So uh, Spring Rest Docs was something we definitely wanted to look at uh, for the future of our, of our APIs. The next thing that came up was what we wanted our uh, UI to look like. So this is an example of the standard Swagger UI. Uh, it's very common, very popular way of uh, showing things. It, it's easy to, to generate and duplicate. Uh, this one I pulled from the uh, Kubernetes documentation. Uh, the other way that is commonly uh, used for UI is what kind of what Spring Rest Docs suggests, and that's using uh, ASCII doc uh, or an ASCII doctor to kind of organize information in a different way. So we were fond, definitely fond of the style on the, on the right uh, because of the way that it organizes things in a, in a more human readable format. If you don't name your URIs consistently, the form on the left can be very confusing for your end users. Uh, and that was something we noticed very early on with the projects that were already using Swagger. We also had some central information that was the same across multiple APIs and that we didn't want to keep documenting on every single endpoint. And there are multiple ways to do that, uh, but most of them had to do with things like uh, how to log in, how to get a token, uh, what the standard format of an error message is. And we wanted a kind of a central place to, to document all of that once and not have to deal with it again. The next thing that I already kind of men or, uh, mentioned so far is that we have lots of little services as we have split up into our microservice architecture. And that meant that we wanted to use the same tool on all of our APIs so that we get the same consistent look and feel. We also had, we're using uh, OAuth with JWT tokens, and this became a uh, small hitch in using the standard Spring Fox UI. Some of the libraries that you can find uh, weren't supporting that, or we'd have to maintain our own custom version of the UI uh, library. Also want to make sure that we version things appropriately, uh, important in all uh, discussions about REST APIs. Of course, this is if you're not using hypermedia. So the first tool that we had looked at was Swagger. Uh, and in fact, some of our oh, APIs use Swagger for other things as well. It's great for standardizing, for having a specification. A lot of third-party tools uh, can hook into your Swagger specification, but it can also be used to generate documentation. And within the first project that we were looking at, which are Spring Boot, there are two different approaches that you can commonly take. So the first one is a library called Spring Fox. There's uh, two components to that. It uh, has super easy install. You can add a few annotations and some 
uh, config to your application main and kind of get going right out of the box. You have to override a few things the more complicated your API is. Um, and you can end up with a bunch of annotations now all over the place. So the install is pretty easy. There's two different libraries. You don't necessarily have to use both, and I'll talk about the alternatives as well. Uh, and you add a small configuration uh, option about where you want things to go. And this can generate a Swagger spec from your source code and those annotations that are on it. Um, and it is a, a test dependency, so you're not adding a bunch of overhead to uh, your application. However, this, uh, it's, it's all generated. Sometimes we needed to customize it a little more than what we were getting out of the box. So the other option was to write and maintain our own Swagger specification, which gave us all everything we needed. Um, but one of the key things that keeps coming up is how do you make sure that this stays up to date? I mean, this is something that we're maintaining ourselves. Uh, it's tedious. It's part of that why I hate writing documentation. Uh, because it's just tedious, and uh, we didn't want to have to do this either. There were a few other considerations with using kind of the out-of-the-box approach, and that was that our um, product team wasn't really happy with the, the generic Swagger UI. So we thought, okay, well, maybe we can just reskin it, uh, but then you have to keep your own version of it, make sure that gets updated every time there's a release. It wasn't really a deal breaker, but there's lots of libraries that let us use ASCII Doctor or Markdown, so we might as well pick something else. The next thing that starts to happen as you add more and more annotations is that you end up with code that looks like this. Now, this is not a particularly long example, but I had to find one that fit on my slide. Um, but notice how the annotations are, or, and I should say, the annotations just related to documentation take up almost half the page. The other thing about these is that there's no verification that these are actually correct. So you can end up with, um, if you make a, a change to your implementation and don't update your documentation, you can get out of sync. Your end users are unhappy because now your documentation doesn't match what they're expecting. Uh, so if we find a different solution to this and take out those documentation only annotations, we end up with something that's a lot cleaner and a lot easier to read, especially if you think about that this is just one method. If you've got a whole bunch of endpoints in the same file, it's so hard to read through that. The next issue that we were having is that we have this really complicated JSON structure. So we ended up having to do a lot of overrides and defining of all the models in the fields because it didn't really mean anything when we had a response of my custom object uh, and it didn't tell you what the fields were, what the potential values are. And it was important that we have those, particularly for uh, QA and other purposes. But there's one feature that uh, is really important with the Swagger UI, and that's the try it button. I know a lot of companies, ours included, depend heavily on this for uh, examples, as well as running it against the, the application itself. However, we were having issues with our uh, security system, or the way that we had the, the tokens, and we were having to do so much overriding and so much customizing of this that uh, it became a hassle. It also led to some lazy testing. So we just hit the button, tried it. We didn't try any other conditions to make sure that uh, all of our endpoints were working properly. So instead, uh, we've started adding curl statements or using 
another tool like Postman to uh, give to our, our QA teams. And I haven't seen too much of a solution yet for this, but there is hope. So there's a new function out of uh, the Postman project where you can add a run button to uh, your API. And what this does is that if your API is public, because it uh, does expose some things here, you can provide your, end, your users with a set of examples that generate in, in Postman, and um, I think that it's a good step in the right direction for alternatives that you can use instead, so you don't have to be stuck into one particular tooling set. Okay, so if you're already using Swagger for other things, you may want to look at how you can enhance that or use other libraries as well. The first one it take, gets care, or takes care of our issue with the way that it looked, and that's to use a library called Swagger to Markup. So that converts your Swagger spec into Markdown instead of using the regular uh, Swagger UI, and you can get something that looks more like what we were hoping for. You can, uh, by default, the paths here are still a little uh, like the, the Swagger UI by endpoint, but you can overwrite this and customize it in any way that you want. The other feature that uh, kept coming up is how to verify that what the documentation says is what, and what those annotations were, is actually what's happening. And you can do that with a library called Assert J Swagger. Uh, so you can kind of prevent these mismatches where what you document is not actually what you intended to. And so you can specify contracts and do contract for Swagger that way to verify that everything is working as you expect. So that brings me to the big topic. How is this uh, test-driven documentation? So if we take our traditional red-green refactor cycle, um, we can add documentation to it, or to this uh, cycle, and make it even better and solve some of the problems that we were having. So now, in order for your test to go green, you have to add your documentation. If you refactor, you also have to update your documentation before everything will pass again. So that was really um, great about this particular approach. And it's right now just the Spring REST docs uh, library that has this functionality. But in general, I think this is a really awesome concept. And that's why I'm so excited to, to talk about this, because there are a lot of really good um, advantages that make this the unicorn uh, or leading the pack against everything else. And that was ensuring that the documentation matched our implementation. We also found that we were writing more tests. Uh, so we were catching more edge cases and things by writing these tests to get the documentation. It removes some duplication. Uh, so if you were annotating all of your documentation and writing tests, you were essentially doing the same thing in two places. And now you can just write the tests and utilize the stuff you've already written, which in effect also removed the annotations from the source code, making it a little bit easier to read. And of course, not all, just the ones related to this documentation. So this brings me to the specific implementation of it, which is Spring REST Docs. And so it is an official sponsored Spring project, sponsored by Pivotal. The lead is one of the uh, Spring contributors, Andy Wilkinson. And as of Tuesday, now released version 1.1.0, which I uh, has some really interesting and exciting things that I was able to contribute uh, with an example using Grails even.
So the things that really make this particular implementation different are that we have generated code snippets. So you can get curl examples, uh, example responses from the tests. It also has a great mechanism to fail your uh, tests when your documentation doesn't match up. The other really important thing about this is that I've started using it in places where I can't use Swagger. Uh, so I don't have an example of hypermedia in this presentation, but there's other ones that I'll refer you to. And this is where Rat Pack came in. So the, the model that Rat Pack uses for uh, mapping out in uh, handling paths and everything is dynamic. So it's not set ahead of time. You can't just read that file and know what all of the possible endpoints are. So um, you could, we couldn't use Swagger. We're trying to figure out what to do. So I was able to write documentation tests. And of course, it's not going to be inclusive because you can't find all the different patterns. But at least you can provide examples uh, using this framework. To get started, you, of course, want to read the documentation. And there are two really good presentations that I suggest watching as well. The first one is from the project lead. He gave a very deep dive uh, at Spring One, which are the, the really long 90-minute talks, on a lot of the how this works and uh, where the project is going to go in the future. The other in, uh, presentation up here is from Devox. It was a, a short 30-minute presentation, spends a lot of time talking about um, the same experiences that he had in implementing it and uh, why you should convince your, your manager to support this. These are both also examples of using it with hypermedia. So the, what I wanted to do today was add to the work that they've already done by providing uh, groovier Spring REST docs through an example, through examples using Spring Boot, Grails, and Rat Pack. So my first example application is uh, using Spring Boot. It is the uh, 1.0.x uh, version of Spring REST docs, which uses MVC test, uh, or sorry, ASCII Dr. Gradle plugin. Also uses mock MVC test, which was uh, the first testing framework supported with Spring REST docs. Uh, and I added examples using Spock instead of the traditional JUnit uh, tests in the rest of the examples. Also going to add that as static assets during the build. So I started with a very simple, uh, there's a Spring Boot app that, available through Lazy Bones and created really uh, trivial example. You can check it out on GitHub. Just to do hello world with two different, I wanted a get and a post. The get ha takes no parameters. The post uh, just, so hello world versus hello something else. Um, let's see. So yeah, anything with hello. Uh, yeah, get and post. Hopefully this should all look familiar to everyone. Raise of hands. Yeah, OK. I will continue. Uh, so the next thing we've got our example is to add the ASCII Dr. Gradle plugin. So who is familiar with ASCII doc and or ASCII doctor? OK, just a few. So ASCII doc is a format for writing uh, documentation. ASCII Doctor is a library that you can use on top that adds a lot of functionality on top of that. There's a Gradle plugin uh, and it uses Ruby and some other uh, dependencies. You can use it to create HTML, PDFs, you can even use it to write books, which has been an interesting uh, use of it, and all of that from a single. Uh, a doc file. So in order to use it with Gradle, uh, there's a, a few things, mostly for if you want to look at these slides later and see the, the how to do it. 
uh, and this is just out of the box ASCII doctor. You can see lots of other presentations that go more in depth on what that is. So I'm going to take this uh, example document. It's fairly easy to read. You've got some formatting things. Looks probably looks a little bit like Markdown if you're familiar with that. And by running the Gradle task, I generate by default HTML that looks something like this. You can configure those style options to, for how you want it to look. But out of the box, it worked exactly as we needed it. The next step was to add some tests. Um, or if you're doing traditional TDD, you probably would have written your tests first. But, um, OK, so Mock MVC is a little different. Uh, it wasn't something that I was familiar with before we started using this. And so I wanted to go into a few different things that uh, weren't intuitive from looking at it as a, a newbie. The first one was how to set it up. So you have two options. You can either set it up using a standalone controller. So if you just want to test something, uh, the endpoints on a controller, you don't need security, any of the other stuff, you can do this pretty simply. You get. Uh, so this should be yeah readable. Do a get uh, and expect what the status is. Verify all of this and uh, what your variables are going to be. So the other option is to spin up the entire thing using the web context, and on it, we ended or usually use it this way. Uh, depending on what your your usage is, you could use either or. Hopefully, I can save you some time from what I'm about to say next. If you keep getting that this context is null, look at your Spock uh, dependency. So this does require Spock Spring, not regular Spock Core. Okay. So now we have an endpoint. Uh, we have a generic document that doesn't have any code samples in it. I've written a few tests and verified that they worked. Uh, so I want to now add, add in this Spring Restox documentation. Of course, this is an official Pivotal image. I made this myself. But this is what I'm going to use for uh, diagrams going forward. So I have to add um, snippets directory for where I want my code samples to go, as well as the dependency. In the ASCII doctor task, I want to make sure that I then read the file where I output all of the generated code. And the other thing I don't have highlighted on here is that I added to depend on the test. So I want this to make sure that this is run after my tests and not um, before. Otherwise, you won't get any code samples. OK. So going back to the example of get, I added in here a uh, apply for the documentation. And this is really how it hooks in. So it can take the things that you already have, um, this get request, and compare that to what we expect. So in this uh, documentation block, there's a, a few different things going on. So the first is just specifying what folder I want it to go to. With lots of endpoints, you'll have your own um, way to do that. Uh, you can add preprocessors, so things like pretty printing it. Or uh, if you want to do things like change the URL because you're running it from a build server or something instead of your running application as well as what fields you expect. And this is really where it um, helps, because we know what we're expecting and then compare that against what actually uh, was generated. So if I add this in and run the tests, I get a bunch of different examples that are formatted pretty nicely things like a curl request, an example response, as well as a table formatted with what the fields are. 
And of course, all of this customized and uh, changed over time. Another important thing, uh, if you're doing a list, is that uh, embedded objects are done with uh, square brackets, uh, useful if you're going through the demo uh, later. So it was also easy to do central information. So in, in this is based on Spring Boot. There's a standard way that all error messages have all these different fields. So I can fake out a, an error response and document, uh, oh, sorry, document it pretty much in the same way. I can do that once uh, on any endpoint and then not have to do that for every endpoint. So the next crucial thing that uh, came up that I found really interesting was what it does when the tests actually fail. So it tells you exactly what doesn't match. So in this case, I had changed, uh, so it says not found was username. So I originally had it as username, and then I changed the field name to name, just trivial. And now those don't line up. Uh, and if you had multiple fields that had changed, it would tell you each one that failed. And so that was really, it has been really helpful when refactoring. Um, so that was, yeah, so if it's in the payload and not documented, the second example is if you uh, expected it to be returned and it wasn't. So there's lots of different options for what can be generated if you specify it. By default, you get the curl request, of course. Uh, you could also do an HTTP request, which is just formatted differently than doing the uh, curl statement. You get the traditional response. You could also create a table of, uh, or table of response fields, as well as descriptors of what types those things are, and any other relevant information that you add in that descriptor field. And the same thing for our request parameters. So now that we have uh, some snippets that are generated, uh, they're going to the build folder, but I haven't really done anything with them yet. So I want to incorporate them into my documentation. And this is, um, so it didn't seem like very many people were familiar with ASCII docs, so I'll go over it a little bit. Um, you can include things, so this is a snippets directory, which is what I had configured in Gradle. Uh, the folder name that I had specified in my test configuration, and then which of those um, examples I want to use. As well as in the bottom, uh, you can pull in other files as well, so of course separation of concerns, uh, you don't want a huge giant uh, ASCII doc to maintain, you want to make it easy to, uh, to read, to go in and change things. Uh, so this is really a very powerful um, thing that you can do with ASCII doctor. Okay. So the next step is that I'm going to build my documentation. So it's going to take the things that are uh, in the source docs directory and convert that into, or, and send that to a folder that I can then serve in my application. And so what I end up getting is something like this. And so this is from my example application, or GitHub repository. And I used the GitHub pages plugin to uh, post these docs to to GitHub so you can actually see what they are and what they look like. So that was the first wave or first release of Spring Rest Docs. It was very, very promising to um, see what that was doing, but mock FVC doesn't work for everything. It didn't work for Grails or Repack or any of the other things that you don't want or don't want to have to add all the Spring stuff to. So what was released uh, just this week is the support for Rest Assured. So if you look in some of my examples, we were working with a release candidate before, but now it is officially released. 
And with rest assured, we can add support for other things, such as Grails and Rat Pack. So my second example is uh, going to be using Grails. So I haven't started with 3.1 yet, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to keep this to 3.0.15, and I am going to use the Web API profile. I uh, create roughly a level one or level two API. Uh, I'm not going to repeat how to do this, but if you're following the steps along, um, you're going to want to add the ASCII Doctor Gradle plugin in the same way at this point. And then uh, we're going to add the rest assured tests with, uh, the, with the documentation. And I'm going to go through a little bit about how I publish those docs to GitHub pages. So super simple Grails app. Um, wanted to just create it. I'm going to create two basic uh, resources. And so the first one uh, that I created was just a note. And this is the same example that's now committed in the official Spring Rest Docs samples directory and it, as part of that project. Uh, so you can go in and look at that as well. Want to have plural rise, added some basic things, and a, a map joining. Just It's the same, same example across all so that you can compare the different frameworks. Similar thing uh, for tags. So at this point, you would add the ASCII Dr. Gradle plugin, same as before. Okay. The, um, oh, the important thing to note here, though, is that if you are using the, or running these as integration tests, uh, remember to specify that you want to run after your integration tests uh, in your, uh, your ASCII doc config. Okay, so now I'm going to switch and go to Rest Assured instead of using Mock MVC. So same thing, and then must run after integration test instead. Uh, this was, yeah, of course, specific to Grails. And you don't necessarily have to do them as integration tests. You can't. There is a, a way to make them run as unit tests. Um, Anyway, so with Rest Assured, it's a filter, same kind of setup for the documentation. It'll hook in. There are a few variations uh, as far as what stage this gets output in. When you run this, it will fail the documentation test before the it verifies what your output is, um, which is the reverse of mock MVC, so just as a, as a note. Okay. So you should have, okay. So filter here, uh, I'm pre-processing these, so I want to specify a particular URI and overwrite that before the example is generated. Uh, okay. And in this case, I am documenting the uh, sorry, the post request. And so I have the request fields as an example here, and I'm specifying a body of what I'm going to actually post to it. Okay. The rest should be the same as, as the other example, mostly. So if you're using something like the Grails web profile, uh, you don't have views or static assets to, to serve. So it didn't make sense to add these um, in the same way. But what I have done on my example side project is to publish these docs to GitHub pages. And so I hook into build docs, which is the default for where these um, are sent and push that up to GitHub. So after all of this is said and done, I get my fancy new example documentation. 
So the other thing that I had talked about is that you can use this for Rat Pack. So I contributed back to the Rat Pack examples, uh, example books repository. You can, um, so if you look at the slides online and hit download, all of these links should be clickable or you can type them in and um, go there and look at the pull request in detail. Um, I can, during the question section, pull that up and we can go through it if you'd like. So there are lots of other things that you can do as well that, uh, like how to add security and headers, which varies based on what testing framework you're using. We've also been using it to document constraints and overwrite some of the existing templates. So one thing that you um, may not have noticed in those tables for when it does uh, request fields and response fields, uh, I ended up adding one for option for whether or not that is optional. So you can add optional as a um, configuration in your test so that it won't fail, but we wanted to notate that in the documentation as well. So the, um, the one that we're doing, we end up overriding the template for that table as well. So all of that is in documentation. It's fairly well documented. The other thing is that, so I did this using uh, ASCII doc format, you can also use Markdown instead. So as a brief conclusion, API documentation turned out to be extremely complex. There were a lot of different factors that came into why we ended up choosing kind of a hybrid solution. Some things are still using Swagger, but then we're using this for our documentation. It wasn't just about the easiest thing to get up and running. It was um, important to choose the tool that made it easy to maintain in the long run. And so Spring Restox is definitely very promising. It is now, I mean, we're at 1.1, so we've gone a little bit into second release. And there's a lot of things still left to be done. And um, ways that I see this is going to definitely improve over the next few months and year. And of course, I still hate writing documentation, but at least it's a little less painful now. So what questions do you have? Or would you like to look at the Rat Pack sample? No questions? Great. So the, so the question is, do I recommend using Swagger or Restox? And that is that I suggest using both. So we use Swagger for some of the other functionality. And um, if it's something that's like really simple that we don't need to customize, but for all of our new projects going forward, we're adding the Spring Restox as the documentation solution. And you can hook into, um, there's some of the libraries that I talked about before. You can verify that the documentation also matches up against um, a Swagger specification if you have one predefined with contracts. Um. Okay. So would you like to see the wrap pack pull request? Is this not on the screen? Can you? Nope. Um, can I? Oh, I'm out of that. This is not extended. Go a little bigger here. 
Okay. So most of the beginning of this is pretty standard. Um, oh, another thing that I didn't mention in the slides is that uh, remember to add the generated folders to your gitignore so that you aren't checking in things that are generated. Um, basic Gradle ended up separating this out into a separate task so that I just run uh, rest docs. Still have this in the, yeah, so this was the M1 version before we released this week, um, or they released it. ASCII doc is the same. Um, added this so that it would uh, redirect the assets in rad pack, which is, um, if, we looked at, if you look at the whole uh, handler for this, you'll see that it gets pretty complex and crazy, and that's why you can't just annotate it using Swagger. Okay. So I, one thing that I do suggest doing is creating, um, or doing the setup for the documentation once and not on every, everything. And so this in, in Ramp Pack, you can create an example application that runs and mocks out everything. This is rest assured. So we did the um, filter for documentation and stubbed out an example endpoint. Um, most of this is, is Rat Pack specific things. Okay. Modified what I want the URL to be, as well as what the request fields were, uh, and response fields. So one thing I do suggest doing is you'll notice that this gets repetitive. If you have classes that uh, or responses that often share output, uh, use good coding practice, separate that out, make it a function, and uh, reuse those. So we had, this was post, an example of a get, uh, or get as a list and get an individual resource. And you can definitely define these and, and reuse example uh, responses. Do have time for maybe one or two more questions if anyone has one. Oh, end of the day. I get it. <laughs> okay, so we'll end there.